Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word, presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. Before Martin Burnham's abduction by Muslim guerrillas on the Philippine island of Palawan in May 2001, the New Tribes missionary gave the devotional at a Wednesday evening service at Rose Hill Bible Church in his small hometown outside Wichita, Kansas. Some of Burnham's last words in the United States were also the last words of Jesus recorded in the Gospel of John, said Ralph Burnham, Martin's uncle. His very last words were, follow thou me, Ralph Burnham said, his voice choking up. Ralph Burnham went on, Martin not only spoke of following him, but he took on that responsibility. Of course, at that time, neither he nor any of us expected how far he was going to be required to go, but he was willing to go. Martin Burnham, age 42, kept that attitude throughout the 376 days he and his wife, Gracia, 43, were held captive by the Abu Sayyaf terrorist group. Just before a Philippine military raid on the kidnappers that led to Martin's death and Grasha's freedom, the two huddled together in a hammock under a makeshift tent. Martin and Grasha had really been thinking that there would be a chance that they would not make it out alive, said Martin's brother Doug, relying on a phone conversation that he had with Grasha. Martin said to Grasha, the Bible says to serve the Lord with gladness. Let's go out all the way. Let's serve him all the way with gladness. The two then had a worship service and prayed in their hammock, recited scripture verses to each other and sang hymns. They then laid down the rest. Shortly after this, the rescue assault began and bullets began to fly, bullets which punctured Grasha's leg and Martin's chest, injuring her and killing him. Like the Apostle Paul, the reason this missionary couple was able to bear up under their affliction, face death, and be willing to serve the Lord all the way with gladness was by looking at things not seen, by living for the eternal, by focusing on Christ, by knowing that the Lord never leaves or forsakes us. Charles Spurgeon once said, Christians can rejoice even in the deepest distress Although trouble may surround them, they still sing. And like many birds, they sing best in their cages. The waves may roll over them, but their souls soon rise to the surface and see the light of God's countenance. They have a buoyancy about them, which keeps their head always above the water and helps them to sing amid the tempest. God is with me still. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7 reads, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Paul says that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. The treasure that Paul's speaking about is the glorious gospel of Christ, as he put it in verse 4. What we see from this is that in God's eyes, the gospel of the grace of God that we stand for and proclaim it is a treasure. It is of great value. And of course, we should view it the same way because through this treasure, we find the forgiveness of all of our sins. We find that we are declared right and righteous by Almighty God and we are redeemed by the blood of Christ. The gospel of God's grace, it saves us from all of our sins. It seals us by the Holy Spirit and it seats us in Christ at God's right hand in the heavenlies forever and it is a treasure and we are rich in Christ because of it and God wants us to spread the wealth this treasure this message has been committed to us earthen vessels fragile clay vessels to make known to this world through our lives and service for Christ having trusted Christ as Savior God has poured the treasure of his gospel for today into us simple jars of clay so we might, through his help and strength, pour it out to others as we share the good news with others around us in life. 
An earthen vessel is an earthenware jar or a common clay pot. These are weak, fragile, brittle containers. And the picture is meant to depict humanity in our weakness. Often we think we're stronger than we really are. And Paul saw himself for what he truly was, a weak and fragile man of clay who had been entrusted with a treasure in his ministry to make known through the power of God. It's good to have a proper perspective on ourselves and our service. And Paul shows here how each of us are weak earthen vessels. And it is only by God working through us that we are enabled and empowered to carry out the gospel ministry for His glory. It is God and His power working through us also that produces any and all effects for good in the Lord's work. And thus the victory is the Lord's in every way, and He deserves the praise. God has entrusted his message to earthen vessels so that the excellency, I like that word in verse 7 there, the surpassing greatness of the power of the gospel of grace might clearly be seen to be of God and not of us, who simply are the voice, the mouthpiece, those who make known God's good news. God uses us in our efforts for him even though we are weak we have faults, we lose focus, we stumble all over our words when we try to share the gospel and we make mistakes and we kick ourselves afterwards when we think about it. But God uses this. God uses common, fragile jars of clay to make known His message so that there is no mistaking the source of the power of the saving gospel that it's of God and not of us. Oswald Chambers once said this, God can achieve his purpose either through the absence of human power and resources or the abandonment of reliance on them. All through history, God has chosen and used nobodies because their unusual dependence on him made possible the unique display of his power and grace. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9 say, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Paul goes on here to show how God has demonstrated his power and presence in his weakness throughout his life and through the hardships of his ministry. I like how one commentator put these two verses. He says this, We were sore pressed, but not hemmed in. At our wit's end, but never at our hope's end. Pursued by men, but never abandoned by God. Knocked down, but not knocked out. These statements by Paul show the trials of his ministry, but they also show God's hand. They show God's presence, his guidance, his mercy, and loving care in the life of Paul. The demands of ministry had brought Paul into some tough and difficult circumstances, and he shows here how sometimes he was troubled on every side or surrounded by trouble, being pressed hard by it emotionally. But Paul says he was not distressed or he was not completely cornered. God never allowed his trouble to crush him or to break him. Paul says he was perplexed or disoriented, confused, lost. He didn't know which way to go or which way to turn. He was unable to find a way out, not knowing what to do next or where to go next. But Paul says he was not in despair or never at his wit's end because the Lord helped him. The Lord showed him the way and brought him out. From emotional trouble in verse 8, he turns to physical trouble in verse 9. And Paul says he was persecuted or pursued and chased and harassed by enemies of the gospel. But Paul states that he wasn't forsaken, never alone, never deserted or abandoned. God was always there. And it's like what Charles Spurgeon said. Paul, too, could say in all his trials, God is with me still. And Paul states that sometimes he was caught by his enemies and he was cast down or physically cast down and struck down to the ground. But Paul says he was not destroyed or he didn't stay down. He got back up with his strength and resolve renewed by the Lord, doing so in the strength of the Lord. Paul had come through many adversities, and he had experienced firsthand the power, the presence, and the grace of God in his life. 
2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 10 through 12 say, Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then, death worketh in us, but life in you. A man went to see his doctor in an acute state of anxiety. He said, Doctor, you have to help me. I think something's seriously wrong with me. Everywhere I touch, it hurts. I touch my head, and it hurts. I touch my leg, and it hurts. I touch my stomach, and it hurts. I touch my chest, and it hurts. You have to help me, Doc. Everything hurts. And the doctor proceeded to give him a complete examination, after which the doctor said, Mr. Smith, I have good news and bad news for you. The good news is that there's nothing seriously wrong with you. The bad news is you have a broken finger. Everywhere Paul touched on his body, it probably hurt. In 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 25, Paul speaks of how he received stripes above measure in prisons more frequent in deaths off of the Jews. Five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Paul says here in verse 10 that he was always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. And this speaks of how Paul was bearing real physical marks from his sufferings for Christ. His body bore the scars and bore the marks from his persecutions. Paul stated also in Galatians 6, 17, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Vance Havener once said, We need men of the cross with the message of the cross bearing the marks of the cross. And that was Paul's testimony. And Paul's outward physical bodily marks were a constant proof, as he says there, of Christ's life within him. And Paul desired that, that Christ's resurrection life would be made manifest, made apparent and clear to others through what he was willing to endure for his Savior and making the good news of his grace known. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Growing in God's Grace is a paperback 96-page book written by Pastor John Fredrickson. The studies found in this book are intended to help any believer grow in their knowledge of key subjects in the Scripture. More importantly, we desire that each reader be assisted in their spiritual growth, considering how the Savior wants to transform their lives by their yielding to the will of God, as revealed in the Holy Bible. May we begin in earnest a lifelong journey of growing in God's grace and growing up unto Him in all things. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, Call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. Paul says, We which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. Paul constantly exposed himself to danger and to death as he aggressively proclaimed the gospel. He did so in the face of persecution, and he did so so others would come to know Christ as their personal Savior. And he says again in verse 11 that he was willing to face death so that by his life and his zeal and passionate ministry, it would be a clear proof to others that Christ lives and that he lives in him. And Paul shows the fruit of his persecutions in verse 12 and making the gospel known. He shows that it is as a result of dying to self and constantly being exposed to physical death, 
He says, you, Corinthians, you live. You have spiritual life. You have life eternal in Christ Jesus. He says, death worketh in us, but life in you. Verses 13 and 14 read, We, having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. Here Paul quotes David in Psalm 116, verse 10, when he writes, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. And then Paul adds, we also believe and therefore speak. Paul and David were both greatly afflicted in their lives, as we know from the life of David and as the Psalms show about him. And Paul takes his stand here with David and declares that they had the same spirit of faith. And both of them, in spite of their affliction, believed and therefore spoke. As a result of what Paul believed, he spoke for Christ, even in the face of those who would mock him or strike him down to the ground. Because of what he believed, because of what he knew to be true, he'd get right back up and keep on telling others the truth. And what Paul believed, and the basis for his confidence and zeal and boldness in his life, the reason Paul was willing to take all of this suffering in his ministry was his absolute conviction that Christ lives. And I like how Paul puts that in verse 14, knowing. We know that He lives. Our faith is true and our hope is real. And because Christ walked out of that tomb on the third day with power, having conquered sin and death, this fact caused Paul to always press forward in his ministry. He knew that none of his labors was ever in vain or empty or without meaning. The reason Paul could willingly submit himself to affliction for Christ, constantly expose himself to death, is because he served a living Savior. And because Christ lives, it gives us purpose and meaning for all that we do for Christ. And what we do for Christ now will echo into eternity and for all eternity. Because of Christ's resurrection, Paul had hope of his own resurrection by Jesus, as he talks about in verse 14. And so he knew he had eternal life, and if he did die, he'd be with the Lord, which is far better, and he had hope of his own resurrection one day. And because Paul believed and spoke and proclaimed the gospel, the Corinthian church and their salvation were the fruit of this, so Paul also knew that in the resurrection, he says that Christ will present us with you. Verses 15 to 16 read, For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Paul says that all the afflictions he endured in his ministry were for their benefit. He says, for all things are for your sakes. It was so they might be saved, so they might grow in the truth. And upon trusting Christ and having been saved as a result of God's abundant grace, like how Paul puts that, Paul says, thank God, not me. And as God's grace overflows towards us and God constantly gives and gives and gives to us in life, Paul tells the Corinthians that our thanksgiving to God should redound or overflow and return to the glory and praise of God. Paul desired that many be reached so that many more might lift up their thanksgiving to God for His abundant grace. In other words, that thanksgiving that God might overflow as the result of many more being saved and many thanking God for it. God's grace is abundant and any and all who trust Christ will be saved by His grace. God's grace is abundantly able to save all who believe. Paul says, for which cause, in verse 16, we faint not. The word faint here means to lose heart. Be discouraged, to throw up your hands and to give up. And what Paul is saying is, we know the resurrection is true. We have real hope. 
And so in spite of the hardships, we are not disheartened. We are not giving up. We are not quitting. We are always pressing forward. So more might be saved by God's abundant grace. And so they might offer thanksgiving to him. And all of this is for his glory and praise. And Paul says he's not given up, even if his outward man, his weak, frail, earthen vessel, again, is wearing down steadily day by day. And this was also the result of his many sufferings, that it was uh, perishing and wearing down. But he says that he wasn't quitting and not giving up because his inward man was renewed spiritually day by day at the same time. Thus, he was encouraged, he was motivated to continue on in his ministry. His resolve was invigorated. As Paul got older and his body weakened with age, he says his inner man and his faith grew stronger. Through God's Word, through prayer, through the experiences that God had brought him through, and as he was living by faith in light of eternity and looking at things not seen, Paul was spiritually renewed daily. In this verse, the first part occurs whether we like it or not. The other part of this verse requires effort and discipline. Our bodies are aging and wearing down steadily. But as we give ourselves to his word, as we give ourselves to prayer, to living by faith, hope, and love, we too can be spiritually renewed and built up day by day in the inward man. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18 read, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Paul looked at his afflictions, he looked at his ministry through the eye of faith and with an eternal perspective. And he constantly looked beyond his trials and adversity to eternity, which sustained him in and through them. Like uh, James M. Gray once said, Who can mind the journey when the road leads home? And that was Paul's experience. In light of eternity, in verse 17, Paul saw his afflictions as light and momentary troubles. While we usually look at our troubles from an earthly perspective as working against us, Paul says from an eternal perspective, they were working for us, he says there in verse 17. Looking at our trials from heaven's point of view, if you were to look forward one million years into eternity uh, when you're with the Lord in heaven, and if you were to look back, at the trials in this life, which seemed endless, which seemed like they would never end. Looking back from that point, they will look like they were just momentary. They were just a moment in time, just an instant. Yet these momentary afflictions, Paul says, work for us an eternal weight of glory. And again, if you were to look at your trials from heaven's point of view when we're in eternity one million years into the future, if we were to look back at the afflictions of this life which seem too heavy to bear, they'll seem, as Paul puts it here, as light. Yet these light afflictions, says Paul, work for us a far more exceeding weight of glory. We will be rewarded for our service to the Lord one day. There are eternal ramifications for how we allow the Lord to use our lives now. If we live for the Lord and serve Him now, we will be eternally glad that we did. And any hardships that we might endure for Christ now are just light, and they're just momentary when you look at them from an eternal perspective. And as Paul speaks, points out to us they work for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory in heaven. A.W. Tozer writes this, I've always liked this quote, a real Christian is an odd number anyway, he says. He feels supreme love for one whom he has never seen, talks every day to someone he cannot see, expects to go to heaven on the virtue of another, empties himself in order to be full, Admits he is wrong, 
so he can be declared right, goes down in order to get up, is strongest when he is weakest, richest when he is poorest, happiest when he feels the worst, he dies so he can live, forsakes in order to have, gives away so he can keep, sees the invisible, hears the inaudible, and knows that which passeth knowledge. Paul says in verse 18 that he looked not at the things which are seen. The term look there in the Greek means to consider, to keep in view as your focus. Paul says that he was not fixing his attention on the seen, the temporal in his life and ministry. He wasn't keeping his focus on his circumstances. Rather, his strength to endure his affliction, to not faint and to never give up, and it all came as he kept his spiritual eyes and attention fixed on things not seen or on eternal things. And for us also, we gain a proper perspective of this life. Spirit, we gain spiritual strength and growth. We gain the renewal of the inner man as we keep our focus on the eternal and on the eternal consequences of our lives and service for Christ. 1 Peter 1.8 says, Whom having not seen, ye love, and whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Most of all, as we look at things not seen, we look to Christ, our Savior and Lord, whom we have not seen yet. We look to Him for the strength, the guidance, the comfort we need in life. We look to Him for Him to come at any moment to catch us away to heaven at the rapture of the church. The things which are seen are all passing away. They're all temporal. They're all scheduled to be burned up one day when this earth is refurbished with fire one day. God would have us focus on Christ and on the things of eternal value because the things that no human eye has seen are the things that are truly lasting. It's been said that faith is to believe what we do not see and the reward of faith is to see what we believe. We walk by faith and not by sight. But one day, our faith will be sight. The things which are unseen will be seen, and we will see heaven, we will see that eternal weight of glory, and we will see our Savior face to face. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, May you be transformed by God's grace.